Few LEGO themes have history quite like LEGO Harry Potter. You see, since 2001, the LEGO group has on and off had Harry Potter sets on shelves, and here, all this time later, the theme seems to be going as strong as ever. But today, we're going to analyze the earliest point in this theme's history, which is perhaps its most fascinating chapter, and that's the Sorcerer's Stone releases in 2001 and 2002. You see, LEGO made the very smart move, or perhaps they just got really lucky, and partnered with Warner Brothers ahead of the November 2001 theatrical release of The Sorcerer's Stone to make a whole range of sets in September of that year. If you've seen any of these 2001 through 2003 sets before, I think you can understand that LEGO has come a long way since the sets of this era. Yet, it's my hope over the course of this video, if you don't think this already, that you will come to see these sets as some of the best that the line has ever produced, and that they really laid the groundwork for one of the company's most successful and iconic themes. So, hey, let's take a closer look. LEGO Harry Potter hit the ground running in September of 2001 with perhaps one of the most elaborate of product lineups for its time. There wasn't necessarily a lot of gear items or anything like that, but this wave hit shells with just a ton and a huge variety of play sets. We're gonna go through these sets in order by set number, so I hope you can forgive a little bit of chaos in the ordering. LEGO orders the set numbers by set size, not by chronological story order. Yet though, our first set at least takes place somewhat towards the beginning, and that is the Sorting Hat. This tiny little set makes for a fascinating introduction into the world of Harry Potter. The thing I enjoy most about this set is the creative liberties that it takes, and the fun that it gives this set that isn't necessarily movie accurate. No, there wasn't exactly a big spinnable dial that sorted students into their houses, but its inclusion here actually gives you the opportunity to randomly sort your students into various houses. And the character that it gives you to sort is Harry himself. This figure is actually exclusive to the set, even though we'll see many variants of Harry throughout our revisiting series. This one is special because he features a generic Hogwarts robe. He has no house markings yet, which makes sense because you're about to sort him. The most notable thing about these early Harry Potter figures is that they use yellow for skin tone rather than light flesh, which would be introduced in 2004. I do like the more realistic skin tones that they have now, but this is undeniably charming and wonderful and feels so much more Lego-like than the more realistic figures that we have today. And you'll notice too throughout all these sets because they were made before 2004 we're making use of old brown, old gray, and old light gray too. Harry's wand is just a basic four stud long brown bar. His cape though is absolutely wonderful and it's great that these were standard throughout these first waves of Harry Potter. Every student had a cape, a printed cape of that too with the star pattern. Great stuff. The set here is simple and wonky though it might be is quite fun. There's a lot to do with relatively few pieces. There's that beautiful printed circular tile and trust me we'll be seeing a lot more prints throughout the Harry Potter theme. Something that is almost standard. There's just a few instances in which they use stickers but that is connected to a rotating plate which allows it to spin very freely and there's another wand here in black to determine which one wins? It looks like we got Gryffindor. Awfully fitting, I suppose. The rest of the scene just makes for great detail with these wonderful torch pieces, some golden for the time goblets, and we've got Hedwig here too. There's also this classic magic pattern printed on a two by two tile that can be slotted into the back section right here, which of course also spins. The seat which you can attach Harry to spins too. Lots of spinning stuff. Spinning is the theme here. I'd interpret that 2x2 two two tile to be the list of students' names that McGonagall has. Beyond that, there isn't too much to say about this set. It is built atop an 8x8 plate, which you'll come to see is very important to how these first few waves of LEGO Harry Potter operated and can to some extent fit in with the rest of the modular system. And that modular system is going to become very apparent with the next set. And now forgive me for this one because we're jumping to the very end of the story with the final challenge. The scene here depicts Harry and Professor Quarrel slash Voldemort in front of the Mirror of Erised. The Harry Potter minifigure included here, I believe is the most common Harry variant ever produced, appearing through all sorts of sets throughout these first two years of the theme. Compared to the one we saw in the set before, the only change is the Gryffindor robes as opposed to the regular generic Hogwarts robes. The other figure included here is exclusive to this set and remain the only Professor 
Quarrel minifigure for 17 years. This figure here is quite noteworthy. He's one of only a few ever done in the color purple. This is the classic LEGO purple, which unfortunately has since been discontinued. He was also the first figure to ever have a double-sided head. On one side you have the face of Professor Quirrell, and on the other, as you would expect, you have Voldemort's face. And now, all these years later, double-sided heads are pretty much standard, but this was the theme that started it all. And again, it was really cool that capes were such an integral part of the minifigures throughout this theme. Quirrell has a black unprinted cape. It wasn't a necessary inclusion, but it feels so wizardy, so perfect and just makes the character feel all the more special. For the set itself, this is one of the smallest possible modules that you can add onto your Hogwarts display. It's simply built to top an 8x8 brick. The most important feature here is the Mirror of Erised, which is a sticker, but it's a very fancy sticker. It's a lenticular image showing from one angle Harry without the Sorcerer's Stone, and then from another angle Harry with the Sorcerer's Stone. It's also built within that rotating wall piece, and on the other side is the actual Sorcerer's Stone, which is just one of the common LEGO crystals done in transparent red. Simple and small though the set may be, there's all sorts of fun details throughout. In the front, there's a giant spider web in dark gray with a transparent orange spider, which is really cool. And then above it is another new animal, a recolor of Hedwig from that first set, this time an owl in black. And as we look up toward the top, you probably got sight of another new element, and that's the 6x6 roof piece, which is really quite fascinating. Overly specialized? Absolutely yes. But does it look great in this context? Also, absolutely yes. If I'm not mistaken, that piece was actually recolored in transmedium blue for a Belleville set? Pretty dope. I need to get my hands on that piece at some point. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention that of course there's another animal in this tiny tiny set. There's a bat making up some wall detailing on the back. The thing that sets these early years of Harry Potter apart is the inclusion of all these special items and pieces and what I'm going to dub magical elements. Things like the owl, the spider, the bat, they weren't there in the books, they weren't there in the movies, but they contribute to an overall aesthetic that's playful and whimsical. You see, the Harry Potter sets of 2001 had no interest in appealing to adults. They were completely made for kids. That can't be said of the Harry Potter sets that are made today, and you see those compromises come through in the sets, where the sets look a lot better than they do here, but you don't have the fun little extra details that these early sets did. Now, one of the coolest things about all these sets are the instruction manuals, which quite simply are works of art. I don't have every instruction manual for every set, but thankfully I do know someone who can help me fill in some of the gaps, and that's Brian Furks. I met Brian while on the set of LEGO Masters Season 2, and we quickly found out that we were both big LEGO Harry Potter fans. In fact, I think Brian and I have been talking about collaborating on this video for at least two years, so I'm really happy to invite him in here and share with you some of these relics of the early 2000s. Hi, it's Brian Ferks here, and I want to take a closer look at some of the instruction booklets from this 2001 Harry Potter wave. Now, this is actually the first LEGO Harry Potter set that I owned, very nostalgic for me, and it has some really fun things on the instruction booklet itself. So, let's take a closer look. All right, so here we have the cover to the instructions, similar to the box art, very beautiful, like all of the images from this wave. Uh, but I wanna take a look inside to see these kind of crazy images that you have after you finish the build. So here's the last step of the build here, but then they show off some of the fun play possibilities of the set, which apparently include Quirrell seemingly kicking Harry, and then of course you have Voldemort being revealed to Harry once Quirrell takes off his turban. So then you can continue on to a really fun feature in these instruction booklets, which are the alternate builds. And this set has some really fun ones. This first one here is Harry launching a spiderweb catapult into a little bin here that's actually the top of the tower turned upside down. And you have Quirrell kind of coming over and helping him out with the next little one to launch into with the catapult. Uh, so this is kind of hilarious. We move on to the next one, and this has its own art which is so incredible. We see this beautiful sky gradient, stars in the sky, and those stars make sense because, of course, Harry is looking through a telescope. And it's fun that the end of this telescope is actually the Sorcerer's Stone ruby piece that they used at the end there. And this is a really clean, nice little build that I think is just gorgeous and is a great way to kickstart that imagination that, of course, these alternate builds are meant to do. 
Now this is the point where I would have liked to have shown you set number 4703, but unfortunately, uh, it doesn't exist. Which makes me wonder what that set would have been and why it got cut from the line. My best guess is that it was Snape's challenge in front of the Sorcerer's Stone, the potion challenge, but because it was cut from the film, it ultimately wasn't made into a set. My other guess would be it was maybe it was an expanded version of the chess room, which makes a very small appearance in this next set, 4704, The Room of the Winged Keys. The Room of the Winged Keys is based off of that modular system, like I said, that we'll be seeing throughout this video. It has two different hinged sections, an 8x8 brick section and an 8x16 brick section. But before we get into the set, let's look at the minifigures. We have, go figure, that version of Harry again. But I don't want to undersell him because the fact that he includes a cape in each and every one of these sets is so good and something I desperately wish they'd bring back in modern LEGO Harry Potter sets. It really does elevate these minifigures and you know that it costs them virtually nothing to make a cape like this. The other minifigure though is new and that's Ron Weasley. Ron is very similar to Harry. The hair piece color there is very interesting. It's called Earth Orange and is another unfortunately discontinued color. It certainly conveys the brightness of the red Weasley hair. His wand is an old light gray instead of Harry's brown. In the set itself, the larger portion of the model is dedicated to the room of the winged keys. And the winged keys themselves are kind of perfect being, well, keys with clip-on wings. There's four regular ones included in this set, and you can push them out of the wall as they are just lightly held in place by a tile below and a brick above. I guess this simulates them flying around the room. It's a function I don't entirely understand. You can remove the keys very easily too. They're barely held into a one by two Technic brick with an axle hole and tan. There is one very special key in this room, and that's the chrome silver blue winged key. <laughs> it's almost too obvious that that is the correct key key, but I like getting something really special. All these keys too can fit in that lock in the door and can spin once you put them in. It's a really good part design. There's also a broom attached to the wall so that Harry can fly around and grab the key he needs to. And now that I think of it, we haven't gotten a Room of the Winged Keys since this one, which is kind of interesting. I'd like to see LEGO's modern take on the set. One thing that we have seen the modern equivalent of is the chessboard. Just a few years ago, LEGO released a giant chess set with the entire trio in brand new costumes and the Golden Snape minifigure. Great set. This version is much simpler. It's made up of a 3x3 three three grid with only one chess character, the Chess Queen. The Chess Queen is an absolutely fascinating minifigure. She makes use of the dress piece equivalent of the time, which was a 2x2x2 two by two by two slope. And then her head, to allow for that beautiful chrome crown, is just a 1x1 one one cylinder brick. Up until this point, the crown had been used only for Belleville sets, but it's really fun to see it appear here in that chrome color. For other noteworthy parts of the set, we've got another spider on a web, this time in trans neon green, and then we also get that big fancy roof piece. Before we go on to the next set, there's just one thing I wanna highlight here, and that's the fact that uh, the exterior is not of importance for these sets, almost at all. The only exception really is going to be the big flagship Hogwarts Castle. The emphasis for these sets, especially the Sorcerer's Stone challenge sets, is always, rightfully, the interior. And this contrasts so sharply with the sets of today, which have beautiful exteriors, but then oftentimes under-detailed interiors, if they have any sort of interior at all. The next set is another great example of this. Set number 4705, simply titled Snape's Class, is perhaps one of my favorites of these early waves of Harry Potter. There's just so much magic and character put into this tiny little set. As you would expect from a set called Snape's Class, you get Snape himself. And it's so funny because the absolute insanity that is this minifigure has probably been lost on me after decades of getting used to him, but taking him out of all that context and viewing him by himself, this guy's kind of ridiculous. Snape has a glow in the dark head. And I just wonder at what point in the design process with what level of information was that decision made? Remember these sets were released before the movies came out, which means that they were still being made while the movies were still being made. There is another Harry Potter character a few years down the line from this that would also have a glow-in-the-dark head, and that's Voldemort. So my theory is, if you're evil, or kind of mean at least, 
maybe not all out evil, you, you get a glow in the dark head, but Lucius Malfoy doesn't get a glow in the dark head. I don't know. But having seen Sorcerer's Stone for the first time when I was probably five years old, I think it made sense to me. Snape was scary, and having a glow in the dark head is kind of scary. It makes a lot of sense to me all all these years later, even if I can't put it into words. I'm curious, if this is your first time seeing glow in the dark head, Snape, what do you think about that? Does that make sense? Anyway, I think we've gone on about that enough. This figure is great too, because he does have printed legs, which is pretty unusual for this time period for sure, but also pretty special within the Harry Potter theme too. The only other example of this in these first two waves is going to be Dumbledore. The other minifigure included here is Ron, who is identical to his appearance in the set before this. And yeah, the set itself, it's awesome. Lego leans into a darker color scheme for the dungeons of Hogwarts here. We've replaced the tans with dark grays and light grays and blacks. It works really well and helps this set stand out. Now we were talking earlier about set 4703 which got chopped at some point and we'll never know what that set was supposed to be. But there's another aspect of the films that got chopped that Lego didn't quite get the memo on and that's Peeves. And now I've heard that even the actor who played Peeves in the movies had no idea his part had got axed. He had gone to sit down with his family to watch the movie and he just never showed up in it, which is probably fairly common for the industry, but also ouch. But Peeves is indeed in this set. You can find him hidden behind this potion it's beautifully printed potion cabinet, I might add, which is one of my favorite builds in the entirety of Lego Harry Potter. But it's hinged, so you could open it up and see Peeves standing inside, which is pretty great. He's a simple, simple minifigure, and he substitutes really well as pretty much any generic ghost. There's a number of other fun accessories on this little cabinet build. A key off to the side, a goblet and some potions on top. Not based off anything in particular in the films, but this is just the designer taking creative liberty and making something really cool and magical and fun. In the middle is a table with some chemistry looking thing going on, and this can all be lifted up too to reveal some secrets inside. A Lego frog? Yes, Lego designers have always been obsessed with frogs and the other key. If you're unfamiliar with the key elements, they always come in sets of two attached to a sprue, much like the Harry Potter ones of today. Up in the front, we have presumably Scabbers the Rat. We've got a very fancy door with a door frame, another very overly specialized piece. I think though it works within the context of these oversimplified sets. And next to it, we get this beautiful printed classic Lego book. There's a number of these that appear throughout the Lego Harry Potter theme, and they are just exquisite, featuring a unique print on the front, a unique print on the spine, and a unique print on the back. They can be opened up as well, and they can fit a 1x2 tile inside, something that many of the other sets in this theme will put to use. Though the newer books that they have today are very nice and much more LEGO compatible, they've got studs on the inside, they've got a bar for minifigures to hold, nothing quite matches getting three prints plastered all across the book. Great stuff, and I do miss these books and books styled like this very, very dearly. On the last section over here, you'll of course see that spider and spider web. And down below we have this massive cauldron with an oversized Belleville ladle in it. There is a small play feature associated with this in that you can pull the cauldron back to reveal another one of those two by two spell tiles that we saw in the first set, the sorting hat. And then on the top, yet another six by six roof piece in sand green. It's worth noting too that all these module sets that we've been looking at are the same height, and so you can still Stack them and configure your Hogwarts castle in any way you want. This is what the modern Harry Potter sets are based off. This original modular system that worked so well, it made getting a new expansion for your Hogwarts all the more rewarding, because without any modification, you could add it to your modular Hogwarts to make it bigger and more exciting. There's so much fun stuff in this set. Great pieces, great minifigures. It's magical, it's fun. I would love to see another potions classroom from Lego, but I sincerely doubt they will be able to capture the charm that this original potions classroom set has. Snape's class 4705, one of the coolest sets in this wave. So let's take a look inside. 
Instructions pretty standard, but let's head to the back again to see some of the final images and builds. So this is when you've completed the set. And now we look again, similar to the final challenge set. We see some of the fun that can be had inside the set in little images. Here we have Snape hanging out with Ron here. It looks like they're best buds here. Snape looking through his magnifying glass, some of the potions that they could possibly do. And over here we see uh, some of the play features that you can do in the set. Um, but then this is a really fun alternate build that we get on the next page. Uh, and right here, <laughs> this to me looks like a tower that's intentionally booby-trapped by Ron. It looks like you can have a little floor plank right up here that then you can release using this hinge brick right here to make Snape fall down to the floor below. And Peeves seems to be in on the gag. He's here at the door uh, holding the key. I'm, I'm thinking maybe locking Snape in so that he's trapped in the tower. We move on to a second alternate build. Here we have Snape on this seeming precipice where he has his cauldron out and down below there's the flame that of course is going to heat the contents of the cauldron and here we see it on a hinge so that this precipice can seemingly move back and forth over the flame maybe to just get all sides of the cauldron there to make sure your potion is heated through uh, and this is just a fun kind of wacky alternate build I don't know why that's functional to have to walk out basically on this plank to be able to brew your potion far above the fire below but hey it's an alternate build kickstarts the ideas for what you could potentially do on your own. Next up is 4706, The Forbidden Corridor. This set here is pretty awesome. First up, we get the entire trio here, which is great. Ron Weasley is the same one that we saw in the last two sets. Wow, Ron, crazy. But we do get a slightly modified version of Harry here with a violet cape instead of the printed black star cape. This, from what I understand, is meant to represent the invisibility cloak, which is kind of cool. And then finally, we get Hermione. Unsurprisingly for this era of Lego, uh, female characters were pretty hard to come by. And that face print looks nothing like Hermione. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again, but yeah, Lego was very much still trying to figure out how to uh, draw women and they, they just hadn't quite gotten there yet. One thing I do like about this minifigure though is the hairpiece. The set here is pretty expansive. It gives you two challenges again for the price of one. You've got of course Fluffy who's pretty hard to miss and then the Devil's Snare beneath him. But there's also lots of other fun things tying these two sections together, like this giant staircase. These staircase elements were introduced first for Harry Potter, but I was very surprised to find that they're actually still in production today, appearing in a friend set very recently. There's no studs or anything, and they are, they, they, they're they very, very wobbly. But that does give you the opportunity to fold it up to become a wall, which is pretty magical, making a staircase appear out of a wall. I wonder if they'll use that for Dumbledore's office. But yeah, they're they're very finicky, and if you pick up this set and move it, they, they slide together. They're not not great but I mean they look pretty cool and that's good enough for me but you can take that staircase up to the top here where you'll find a chest with some fun items such as a printed flute I think this is another time where Lego got left in the dark there's no harp in this set and instead to play the music to lull Fluffy to sleep you've got a flute you get a printed four lung bar done in a very rare color here this can be a very expensive piece to replace I think it goes for about three to five dollars just by itself the key will get you through the door but what awaits you on the other side is pretty scary that's a custom molded Fluffy and dang this is peak early Lego creature design. It reminds me very much of the earliest minifigure scale dinosaurs. It looks and feels so classic Lego. It works in the Lego setting, which I don't think can be said of all the molded creatures that they're making today. This feels Lego. It's hard to put my finger on it, but I think part of it is just the simplicity of it and also the molded details over using comical prints. I mean, compare this to the 20th anniversary Fluffy and you'll see what I mean, right? The biggest advantage this Fluffy has over the newer one is the fact that it can open and close all three mouths. You can see that the mold of that lower jaw also is very much the crocodile dragon head just fused into this Fluffy body. Just like in the films too, Fluffy is guarding a trapdoor that will drop you straight into the devil's snare. 
It's a simple mechanism, but it actually has some animation to it. And you can open and close the mouth and it rocks the thing around. As I like to do, you, you can eat minifigures with that. And as a kid, well, and as an adult, it doesn't get better than that. Sorry, Ron. And behind that as a backdrop, you've got no less than two spider webs, each with a black spider on them. And then of course, some bat detailing again. There's even more bat detailing up here. I really like this set. The only downside is that because it is taller than the others, it is a lot harder to incorporate into the modular system. You actually end up connecting modules here instead of on the slope pieces here. So I really wouldn't have minded if the staircase got omitted because that ultimately is what's making everything so tall is the attempt to include this in a reasonable manner. Otherwise, great set though. Set 4707 is Hagrid's Hut. And it's hard to think of a Lego Harry Potter location that has been done more times than Hagrid's Hut. We've seen so many variations of this iconic house, but the 2001 version really brings something unique to the table. And uh, of course, that's that crazy, crazy roof. Let's look at the figures this set has first. Hagrid's Hut gives us our first Lego Hagrid. And he looks pretty crazy now, but I bet in 2001, he was even more foreign to Lego fans. Hagrid here completely changes what can and what cannot be a Lego minifigure. I don't think I need to point out how absolutely wild this torso is. And also let's take a moment to appreciate that this guy has molded fingers. The hands are part of the arm mold, meaning they cannot articulate in any way, but the arms can go up and down. The beard hairpiece, unsurprisingly, was new for this minifigure and was one of the earliest to be done in that rubbery plastic that has become a lot more common today. I'm glad they went all out for Hagrid here rather than make him a standard minifigure. He really does feel like a half giant. The other minifigure is Albus Dumbledore, the first version of him, a figure that we go on to see many variants of as well but they did a great job with the first one here. He, like Professor Quirrell that we saw a few sets ago, makes use of the old discontinued purple color, and it's really fitting, I think, for this character. Also gotta love that purple cape on him. I suppose Hagrid's Hut here is the first set to include side builds. We'll take a look at those. One is a very simple cart. There's not much to say about it. You could use it to transport baby Norbert, who we'll see here in a sec. The other build is a little more interesting. It's a trap complete with a rat in there ready to go. All you need to do is pull out this little stopper and it will close, capturing the rodent inside. And then there's the hut, which is just so crazy. This is just one of a handful of Harry Potter sets that showed Exterior is important too. In fact, the thing is finished around all sides, which is pretty crazy compared to some of the sets we've been seeing. And that's all made possible by the fancy cardstock roof. The roof is actually held together in a pinnacle by a rubber band, which is another pretty avant-garde technique for LEGO to employ. Removing that though, allows you to open up the model in one of the most satisfying of ways. And you can see a pretty awesome interior with lots of fun, magical details. It's so interesting that LEGO was able to accomplish that pretty unusual octagonal shape back in 2001. Most of the Hagrid's huts that we've gotten over the years are just boxes. Yet this one was rounded and closed up around all sides. First one just nailed it. I can say that that roof, probably unsurprisingly, is a pain to work with but the look that it accomplishes is pretty much perfect. But anyway, onto the interior. So as you can see, each section here, each eighth of the hut is built atop these wedge plates, and each one has some special feature, even if they are pretty simple. The first one, of course, is the door. Second over here, we have a barrel with some tools, a Fabuland axe and a pickaxe. The next one has a window and a torch. The next has some potions, goblets, Rome gold keys. The next is the table with owl. This one is the most fun one though. This is the fireplace, which actually extends outward from the build a little bit. You can open it up as the grate is just attached to a hinge. And on the inside, you can actually cook up the Norbert egg and get it ready to hatch. And yes, this set does come with Norbert the dragon, which is a special mold developed for Harry Potter. The dragon mold here would go on to be used in many other sets, but this was the first time he appeared and the only time he appeared in sand green. 
It's a very charming mold, honestly. The dragon has a great smile. And I honestly always prefer the molded detail even over printed details. You spin the whole fireplace around by means of the chimney. Next over, we have this cabinet of sorts, and you can open up this as well, and there's another one of those beautiful printed books. Judging by the cover art, it is a guide for taking care of dragons. There's some fun spine detailing, and then on the back, there's a spider on a web. And then on the last segment, there's a trans neon orange spider, and then just a small tri-leaf plant on the windowsill. I do really love this take on Hagrid's hut. It's delightfully unique and works so well. I do have the original instruction manual for this set too. And can we just take a moment to appreciate that these things were works of art? Yeah, they ate up a lot of ink, but they sure looked good doing it. Each page of the instruction manual really just brought you into this magical world. And I think it made the experience of building these early Harry Potter sets really quite special. One thing I really enjoy about these early LEGO Harry Potter sets uh, is the inclusion of alternate builds. And I bought this instruction manual in particular to highlight probably one of my favorite alternate builds found throughout all of LEGO Harry Potter, and that is the S'mores Party with Hagrid and Dumbledore. That is amazing. I love how these simple little builds completely transform the main model into something imaginative, playful, and nonsensical, but so much fun. I mean, I believe this scene is, is canon. Dumbledore and Hagrid got together at some point and had a little cookout at his place. Alternate builds is something LEGO desperately needs to bring back. This is the perfect starting point for creativity to get people breaking away from the instructions and building something of their own. We need more Hagrid Dumbledore cookouts. Another set that sure has been done a lot over the years is the Hogwarts Express. And while this by no means is the best Hogwarts Express LEGO has ever done, it still brings that 2001 charm that you'd expect from these early sets. The three minifigures included here are new, so let's take a look at them. We get a new variant of Harry in his everyday clothes. Nothing too crazy going on, but it's nice that even this early in the theme, we were still getting all sorts of different costumes for these guys. It's the same deal with Ron, who also has his everyday clothes. Also, interestingly enough, done in blue. And then we get a new subtle variation of Hermione. This is like Harry from that original Sorting Hat set. She just has her regular Hogwarts robes because, of course, at this point in the story, she hadn't been sorted into a house yet. And you gotta love that attention to detail, too. Just like in the movie, Hermione's all ready to go for the sorting ceremony, while these two are still pigging out on candy in their everyday clothes. Great stuff. You do get a small side build here that is just this luggage trolley with two suitcases in it. The only thing that caught me a bit off guard about it is that the fact that the, these wheel holders are in white. I don't know if that's rare or not, but something I'm not used to seeing at least. You do get platform nine and three quarters. And that, that brings me to the one thing I really don't like about this set. And that's the fact that this is one of the only sets in these early waves of Lego Harry Potter to use stickers. And uh, they did not hold up well over time. At least in this copy of the set that I found out of Bricks and Minifigures, all the stickers are hopelessly peeling, and it's really gross and sad and wish they would have used prints. There are some really fun details on the platform though, the best of which I think is the platform nine and three quarter sign atop that red lamppost piece. I mean, that's just great stuff. How can you not love that? And there's just a regular lamppost on the opposite side too. On the platform, there's this container with yet another beautiful printed book. This is a potion book. On the front, you've got a potion bottle. On the side, you've got a vial, and then some more potiony things on the back. These books are so great, and there's so many different kinds of them too. It's bonkers. There's another revolving door here in the middle with a giant sticker on it to get you from King's Cross Station to Platform 9 and 3 quarters. As you would expect from any Lego Harry Potter set from this era, lots of animals. There's a spider on top and also a headwig up here, which is pretty great. And there is just a little bit of detail around the back in the form of these two lamps above the station. Then we can take a look at the train. The train is all right, especially when you compare this to the most recent versions of the Hogwarts Express, it doesn't hold up all that well. But bear in mind, they were working with a much more limited parts inventory than what we get today. They've still managed to cram a lot of fun details into the set, especially within the engine. The engine can open up revealing some secrets. The red part of the engine has quite this fun mechanism which, for whatever reason, uh, can 
Launch the chest out. Inside the chest are two chrome gold keys, which you can never have enough of those. And then there's another hidden compartment in the black part of the engine. And believe it or not, that is where Trevor the Toad is hiding from Neville. <laughs> That's pretty great. In the conductor station, not too much going on. Just the mechanism to launch the chest and then two levers. The back of the train can completely be lifted off for great access into the interior, which is awesome. You can fit up to four students in there. Scabbers is in here. And there's also our first chocolate frog wizard card. Again, it's a stickered element, but it must be a slightly higher quality sticker because it's held up a lot better than any of the other ones. I suppose I don't know what the word for it is, but it's shiny and colorful and pretty and stuff. And if you view it from the right angle, just like the wizard cards in the films, the wizard inside disappears altogether. We'll be seeing this wizard card again, just the sticker is placed on a different colored tile. This time it's in dark gray, and then in another set, which we'll see soon, it's stickered onto a black 2x2 tile. This was the last 2001 Harry Potter set I ever picked up. While nice, I didn't feel like I was missing out on too much. The modern versions of the train are just so much better. And surprisingly too, the 2004 edition of the Hogwarts Express is nearly identical to this one anyway. But we'll take a look at that in a future Revisiting Harry Potter video. All right, so now we're gonna make a slight detour before we get to the big Hogwarts castle from 2001. The Sorcerer's Stone wave of sets is divided into two waves. The first that came out in September of 2001 and the second wave of Sorcerer's Stone sets that came out in January of 2002. That second wave kind of served as an in-between before the Chamber of Secrets secret sets would drop later the same year. And believe it or not, there actually is a tiny little set here, and this is Flying Lesson from January of 2002. The smallest of all the Harry Potter sets we'll be covering in this video. Small though it might be, the set does actually pack some very interesting things. This is at least the first time we'll be seeing Draco Malfoy. He's very similar to the other Hogwarts robed characters that we've seen, but of course he swaps out the Gryffindor emblem for the Slytherin one. What's most noteworthy about this character though is his accessory, which is not a wand, but rather the Remember All. This is the second instance of a, a double-sided head print, actually. It's a trans clear head with a ring around it, and the printing is remarkably beautiful, especially for its time. This is not something you would peg for early 2002 LEGO. It's a great little item, and it would only be remade some 20 years later. The other minifigure included here is the Harry that we've seen many times before already. There's a small, pretty unremarkable build included here. It's a broom cart, complete with two wheels and attachment points for two broomsticks which are included in place of wands in this set. For such a small set I think a lot of fun could still be had in this set mainly due to the efficient use of good accessories. Great stuff in a very very simple package. The next 2002 Sorcerer's Stone set is a real treat. I don't know its name though. So we're gonna call this one Troll on the Loose. Regardless, this set is spectacular, mainly because of this beautiful troll minifigure. This guy is perfect. The color of sand blue is perfect. The use of a regular minifigure head. It's, all, it's the perfect size and also keeps this at least somewhat Lego-like because the rest of him definitely isn't, but he looks so good. And something very unusual that we really never saw outside of Belleville is the use of cloth clothing you could not have achieved the same effect with mold or printed details. It really makes this troll something special, and I do believe he honestly holds up today. He's not gonna look out of place in a modern Lego display next to all these new Harry Potter sets. The only thing that could probably use some updating is that brick-built club, but even then, it's not the worst thing ever. And I know you wanna see what, what he looks like. Uh, so there you go. Now we all know. Pretty great. Maybe great's not the right word for it. The other minifigure, go figure, is our typical Harry. The rest of the set is pretty simple too. Very small, the highlight was definitely the troll, but there's some other fun things here too. Remember this of course took place during the Halloween feast, so there actually is a little nod to that in the form of a really nicely printed jack-o'-lantern on the top of the build. Some other play features associated with the set is the ability to smash the sink. Uh, it's just connected to a hinge, but I do like that. There's one of those doors we've seen several times throughout this theme and keys to go with it. And then the other feature is the ability to drop some bricks on the troll from above. Those are just one by one brown bricks. I think the most disappointing thing about this set is that it's not built upon the eight by 16 bricks. 
and so becomes far less compatible with other sets. There is another set built at the same scale that's Slytherin from the Chamber of Secrets wave, and they can kind of be stacked on top of each other with some modification. I wish LEGO would have splurged and put this on an 8x16, or even squeezed it down to an 8x8 to make it compatible with the other modules. And since, too, this set has not yet been recreated ever since 2002, I do think it's a worthwhile addition to your collection. The largest set of this second wave is set 4714 Gringotts. It's a set that, as a kid, I really don't think I gave it the credit it deserved. I was recently reintroduced to this set while doing a comparison video for the new direct consumer $430 Gringotts. And I think it is when comparing that massive Gringotts to this little guy here that the differences in LEGO's design philosophy became so, so apparent within the LEGO Harry Potter line. Hopefully I will remember to link that video somewhere because I hope you will find it an entertaining watch. We will not do too much comparing here, I promise, though I will say that this set here is heavily referenced in that new direct-to-consumer Gringotts, and it was a delight to see. What this set might lack in beauty, it makes up for in that wonderful classic LEGO Harry Potter charm. More so, I think, than really any of the other sets that we've looked at here today, this thing is crammed full of special parts, special minifigures, and clever secrets. Let's take a quick look at those minifigures. The Harry figure here is the same that was included in the Hogwarts Express, and Hagrid is the same as was included in his hut. The two new and interesting figures here, though, are the goblins, made with brand new molded heads. I noted it in the comparison video, but it is fun to see that the goblins here have tan skin, even though in the film they're they have the same skin as humans. Can you imagine if these guys had been done up in yellow, <laughs> yellow goblin heads? That would have been weird. I think it's things like this that slowly got Lego into the mindset of doing more realistic skin tones for minifigures as well. The set is made up of a number of smaller builds, the smallest of which being this little trolley with some fun items in it to be pushed around by a goblin. There's this great sack of classic Lego coins, that's a printed element, and then the spell print. So now that I'm thinking about that. Have we seen that in any of the sets? I guess not. This is actually the first time we're seeing it, but it shows up throughout many Harry Potter sets, and we'll be seeing it maybe in every single set yet left in this video. <laughs> but it's a really cool tile. Gold printing on a transparent blue tile. The set also includes a small section of the vault roller coaster, which is pretty fun, and it does actually function. Lifting up this allows the cart to roll down the track, and the cart makes great use of the available space, fitting three very differently sized minifigures all on a four by six plate. And simple though the cart may be, there's still some fun stuff going on with two more of those money bags attached to the back. Lifting this to release the cart also reveals a two by two potion tile in sand green. It's really just included there for the fun of it, to have an added sense of mystery and surprise to this set. And I do believe, I've said it again and again, that's what makes these sets so fantastic. The other small build here in the set is a vault. It's primarily made with a little ugly rock piece on the back, and then there's just a hinged door attached to the front. Inside are four classic chrome gold Lego coins, and also this printed package, which is meant to represent the package that houses the Sorcerer's Stone. And then there's the bank portion itself. Does it look anything like Gringotts Bank? No. And I think that's okay. There's still so much fun stuff going on in here. Even if it doesn't look like Gringotts Bank, it does spell it out for you on the front and the back with a beautiful 1x8 printed brick that says Gringotts in shiny gold lettering. Below is the front desk, which can be removed. There are two smaller vaults on either side. Each houses two chrome gold coins. That brings our total chrome gold coin count up to eight. And then there's another bag of money print. That's the fourth one appearing in this set uh, that you place on the desk. And underneath that, there is another one of those two by two potion tiles. On the very top, of course, we got all sorts of Lego animals a white rat, white owl, and a black owl. And this relatively small set has yet one more secret to hide. On top of this tower underneath the black owl, this will actually hinge back, revealing more treasure and even more chrome gold coins, bringing our total count up to 12, which is insane 
when you think that nowadays new those coins sell for over a dollar a piece. So yeah, this set had no shortage of awesome pieces and lots to do given its relatively small size and modest price back in the day. I've got the original instructions for this one too, and you can see some fun alternate builds, one of which is actually referenced again in that latest direct-to-consumer Gringotts. Paging through it right now, this alternate build is actually pretty cool, you know how it ties everything together. It's still very much Gringotts-esque, but I like it a lot. If you're looking for a build that's a little less like Gringotts, uh, look no further than these two here, which seem to make the pieces here part of Hogwarts Castle. And because each one would be built atop that 8x8 brick, it would actually fit in pretty well with the existing modular systems. So that's pretty sweet. Sorry for jumping all over the place, but let's head back to 2001, where we will find what, at least in my opinion, are some of the coolest LEGO sets ever made. Introducing Harry Potter for girls. This is a sub-theme of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone that was targeted primarily at girls. And what that gave you is this weird combination of system Harry Potter with like a Belleville aesthetic. And as a parts nerd and lover of weird Lego and lover of Harry Potter too, it produced three of the most amazing bonkers wild sets we've ever seen from the LEGO group. The first one here is 4721 Hogwarts Classrooms. Two interior 8x8 vignettes with a LEGO Harry Potter minifigure. This is the one that showed up in the Forbidden Corridor set with the violet robe representing the invisibility cloak. I'm fortunate enough to have a sealed copy of the set so you can see what the box art was like. We've got Hermione on the front because this was targeted again at girls. And you can see the backdrop here through the transparent box. And those end up playing a pretty important part in these sets, which also set them apart as if they needed anything else to set them apart from the other sets. The first classroom section has this big orange door frame with a purple door inside. The same pieces that we've seen throughout this series, just in wildly different colors. In fact, so many of the colors you'll be seeing in these sets are just flat out discontinued these days. Like the medium orange of the door frame and the frame for the Mirror of Erised. The Mirror of Erised is accomplished using a sticker, but it's really cool to see these 2001 renderings of Harry's parents in minifigure form. And atop the mirror, there is a chrome gold ball detailing. That's actually a single piece, very uncommon element, something that tended to show up in a lot more Belleville sets around this time. The light violet lavender floor 8x8 plate is also a discontinued color. You'll see too that there's two tiles in this set, very common tiles within the Harry Potter theme, that 1x2 spell print that we saw in Gringotts, and then a new print, a 1x2 sack with gold magic dust, a spider, and a bone. Random stuff, but I, <laughs> again, I still love it. Getting printed random magical details like that is what makes these sets special and awesome. And those tiles too can be put inside the books that we'll see on the other side in the other classroom vignette. And just so much fun stuff going on here with the printed chalkboard, the spider in the cauldron, the potions, those books. I, I, I can't imagine a single Lego fan hating these. They really are something incredible. And then there's these backdrops. It's just a thicker cardstock folded and glued in the middle, which stands up like so. And there's just beautiful artwork all over this. A lot of love went into making these and you can see how they've done a good job too of replicating the, the environments in which you'd expect to find these accessories. It's worth looking at the directions too, which take on a slightly different flavor than the other instructions that we've looked at up to this point, with the red curtains serving as the border rather than the bricks. Just gives you a different vibe. No alternate builds in these, but it gives you some ideas of what to use the accessories for and things like that. Then on the back, it shows the other two sets from this sub theme. Let's take a look at those. 4722 is Ron and the Gryffindor common room. We can take a quick look at Ron here. He is slightly different from his Hogwarts Express appearance. He has a cape this time around, and for some reason he has a translate blue wand. Looks cool, looks magical, and I'm here for it. Back in the day, the only other way you could get that was with a lightsaber, so it made this actually pretty unique. We get the entrance to the Gryffindor common room, which has the portrait of the fat lady. It is a one of those spinning walls again. We'll actually see that same print used in Hogwarts Castle. It's uh, pretty wild to see the fat lady rendered again as uh, a minifigure-esque character. Inside we have some simple furniture atop 8x8 purple plate. 
For some reason, that lamp has just stuck with me all my life as just the perfect LEGO lamp design. It makes use of an unfortunately discontinued one by one by two thirds, something or other flower piece, Scala thing. That light turquoise book is just a recolor of the green potion book, but I do like that color a lot. A very rare color for sure. Not many pieces produced in that one. Over on the other side is a very interesting build because we get a primarily fabric four poster bed. It's a big singular cloth piece that wraps around this build to give you one of those iconic four poster beds from the Gryffindor common room. And then on the inside is actually a Lego fuzzy blanket, just enough to cover most of a minifigure. There's also a drawer here, nothing in it, but on top is a hat, and then you get scabbers, of course. You also get a dark gray owl in this set as well. Again, more great artwork for the backdrop here. I really do like these a lot. It's hard to incorporate this, I guess, into your larger modular Hogwarts, but if this was like the only set you had, it helps round everything out so much more. As a kid, I never had the cardboard backings, got all these secondhand, they had probably long been destroyed. Uh, and they're expensive to pick up these days, don't get me wrong, but it's really fun to see these sets together really for the first time as I do this video, and it's filled me with a lot of joy. It's just such a unique concept that I love so much. I think the closest thing we've gotten to this is those Hogwarts moment sets and the banners. Uh, they do bring back some of this for me. Um, but again, as we've seen throughout all these sets, these older sets were just more efficient with their parts usage. They stretched fewer pieces a lot further by making sure only to include what was absolutely necessary. They could have built this wall out of you know, 300 bricks. Uh, but no, instead they, they printed it and released this set at a very affordable price that anybody could get. Trying to get girls into the Lego hobby, but instead they, they ended up just appealing to 24 year olds like me 20 years too late. And then there's just one more of these to go. This is 4723 Diagon Alley Shops with Hermione. I mean, when it comes to rare parts usage, this one might just take the cake. I haven't done the math on this, but I don't think it's unreasonable to say that a third of the pieces included in this set are included in three sets or fewer. This is such a hard part out. I can tell you that as someone who tried to part it together on Bricklink, we're talking a lot of pieces in here worth a dollar a piece, at least, actually insane. However, it does make for an incredible set. Um, just by nature of it, it is shops that sell weird stuff. So you get tiny little shops that sell a lot of weird stuff. But let's look at Hermione first. Now, of course, in the Hogwarts Express, we got casual versions of Harry and Ron, but we didn't get one for Hermione. But she makes her appearance here with an exclusive, pretty valuable minifigure. The torso sweater is nothing too crazy, but very versatile, and I can see it being desirable for that reason alone. The first part of the vignette is built atop a sand green 8x8 plate. Where do you even start with this one? There's so much cool stuff going on. First of all, we have medium orange drawers all over the place where you could put in all sorts of magical tiles that we've been looking at. On top of the drawers, we've got a potion and yet two more books. The potion book in that light turquoise and then the fungi book, the herbology book in red. Off to the side, there is a stand for capes. The set includes a red cape and one of the classic Lego Harry Potter star capes. And then on the back, so much fun stuff. That's an earth orange broom that's the same color as Ron's hair throughout these first waves. There's two hats. And then in the back, you get one of those beautiful Belleville jugs that I absolutely adore. And one of them has a translate blue flower petal piece. That was one of the expensive pieces to get. And that's all held together by those lamppost pieces that you're probably most familiar with from modular buildings. It makes for a really unique layout and they've shoved a lot of stuff on that relatively thin and narrow shelf and it's all really cool stuff. Moving over to the other side, this is more the pet shop. So there's a lot of pets, such as the owl atop the purple signpost. You get, I assume, Crookshanks there in the form of a cat on the floor. Turquoise drawers. I wasn't sure if there's anything in here, but there are four chrome gold coins yet again in the top drawer of the cash register. In the back, there is a trans pink chest. You got a frog on top. And on the inside is a trans neon orange scorpion. Really, really cool. Above that, you get a rat, a crystal ball, and then all sorts of different wands too. It's probably every color of lightsaber that was being produced at the time. Trans medium blue, trans dark pink, trans neon green, and trans red. I really like the artwork for this one too. 
I think it complements these very well. And on this side, you do get all the animals too, so the shops are divvied up. This is like the ultimate weird part collector set ever. I love it so much. It's great to finally have it completed. As a kid, I probably had 50% of the pieces. Of course, they were all the, the common pieces. Uh, so parting out some of the rest for a dollar was a bit painful, but well worth it to see it all here. And especially with, with the backdrop, it's really satisfying. Really, really enjoy these sets. And I think these are things that people don't realize even exist uh, because they are quite niche within the niche of Lego Harry Potter. Now I wanna briefly talk about the instructions for 4723 Diagon Alley shops because they have something kind of strange for sets at the time and definitely wouldn't see in sets now, which is that Every step of the instructions is taken with real images taken by a camera and then photoshopped into the instruction booklet. And it's not just the step-by-step -step images, it's the little call-outs here too. These are all real images of the bricks that they've then photoshopped into the instructions. Uh, something you don't see really ever anymore. And I think at the time it was common of Belleville sets, especially the smaller Belleville sets. That's the only other place I can think of seeing this uh, around this time in LEGO history. Uh, so this is kind of a crazy little look into what Lego instructions were at the time. You can see every single image, even these step-by-step -step ones, are all showing real bricks taken with a camera. Uh, so I just wanted to call this out as kind of a fun, strange little instruction booklet that uh, doesn't look like the type of things that you'd see nowadays. But that just leaves us with one more set for today's video. The big one, the original Hogwarts castle of 2001's 400 some regularly available Lego sets, Hogwarts was the ninth largest, and it would have cost you a pretty penny back in the day too at its $90. While so many of these flagship sets just don't live up to the hype, Hogwarts here definitely does. It's got an amazing lineup of minifigures, looks great both inside and out, there's plenty of those wonderful play features, those great parts and animals, all the things you would expect from the perfect early Lego Harry Potter set. The minifigures that we're gonna take a look at right away are all ones that we've seen before. Hagrid from Hagrid's Hut and Gringotts, Dumbledore from Hagrid's Hut, Draco from Flying Lesson, Ron from all the previous sets, Hermione from the Forbidden Corridor. We've got a violet caped Harry again, this time with a broomstick too, and then we also get Snape. The castle comes in three distinct parts. We have the boathouse arch, which is the smallest, and there's one of those early single piece boats to go with it. I do believe this will actually float too, which is kind of a nice touch. Not much modification going on here besides a bench and a torch in the front. It can easily fit even with minifigures underneath the arch, which is pretty great. The arch is simple yet very effective, making use of a lot of big pieces like a lerp again, one of these tower elements, and then there's this cool printed one by two by five brick with a stone texturing on it. We'll see two more of those in the set as well. As far as I'm aware, that is exclusive to this Hogwarts set, which is kind of surprising because I feel like it's a very versatile piece. Now, now I'm wondering if it was included in like literally anything else. Oh, uh, it is included in another set. And I should know because it's uh, it's right over there. Uh, it also is included in another Harry Potter set, Escape from Privet Drive. There's two of them in that set. But even so, I feel like there was a lot more use they could have gotten out of that one. Oh well. We'll move on to the next building, which is the Great Tower. You can see the other two one by two by fives printed there on the outside, but all the real exciting stuff is happening on the interior. On the ground floor, we have the library, specifically the restricted section, and there's a play feature associated with that. You can see on the back wall, there is a shelf filled with, of course, those wonderful books. We've got the Red Herbology book, the Green Potion book, and a new printed book, the Black Screaming book that Harry encounters during his trip to the restricted section. You can dump the whole shelf with a simple mechanism in the pack, which is pretty fitting given the scene in the movie. Up front, there's just a little desk. There's a purple magnifying glass on it. I guess I totally forgot to highlight it, but there is one of those included in Snape's class too. It is a functional magnifying glass. And the fact that its rim is made out of transparent purple is just awesome. Looks great. It's so much cooler than having just the regular black one that they continue to use today. It just makes it special. We've got another one of those fancy staircases, which is pretty sweet. Over on the other side is a really fun play feature that is 
very, very unique. On one side we have a fireplace, but we can spin that around in the most unconventional of ways. You can see a rubber band connecting it to this outer wall pillar. And by spinning the wall pillar, it, it spins the fireplace around. It is easier to get your fingers around than the actual fireplace, just given its position in the build. So it is a worthwhile little mechanism, but totally wild. Uh, and very unique. You don't see much like that from LEGO, especially today. They rely on all their specialized technic elements. And then you get access to this transparent, cl transparent clear treasure chest, which is just really interesting. It's like it's made out of crystal. And then on the inside are some crystals, a trans neon green one and a trans dark blue one. Above that, I guess, is the owlery of sorts. You can easily remove this tower. It's not connected by any studs. It just slots into place above some tiles. And there's two owls hidden underneath, a white one and a dark gray one, which is pretty awesome. We'll take that crazy staircase up to the second floor, which is the Gryffindor common room. You'll recognize that print from the Gryffindor common room Harry Potter for Girls set but this time it's printed on light gray instead. On the inside, there is a Gryffindor Knight statue, which is a bonus minifigure included in this set. He's really awesome with a printed Gryffindor shield. Spinning him around reveals a trans light blue crystal. Again, that's not based off anything in the books or the movies. It's just a fun little Easter egg that the designers decided to add, and I love that. Out to the right is just a balcony, but you'll notice this big lever here connected to a brown chain. Pulling that down here on this floor actually opens the lid of the chest above it, which is just really clever, super simple, but it works so well. Inside that chest above is a chrome gold key, yet again, on top are some simple potion designs, and I love the potion designs that are just scattered throughout these sets. Um, I think that's something LEGO should bring back. Super easy, but really cool color combinations. Again, it feels magical. And above that, we have the Astronomy Tower, actually. This is our first unprinted book. Very sad. Uh, it's just a regular light blue book, but on the inside is one of those one by two spell tiles. And then over here, there's just a really simple telescope build. You can't easily remove this all too to get a little better access to it. This would be used for many years in a variety of colors. I'm pretty sure I have a trans glitter pink one lying around somewhere. Back on the outside too, you'll notice that these big curved wall panels also have a very similar design uh, as those one by two by five bricks we looked at earlier. It is printed again, something that will show up in another Harry Potter set too. Then we go on to the very recognizable Great Hall. I think the designer did a great job with this. Again, considering that no one really had seen the Great Hall before, this was something that came out before the movies, considering this would have just been based off concept art, uh, that's, that's pretty awesome. It looks pretty much like the real thing, the thing we all know today. What I love too about this version of the Great Hall compared to any that have been done since is just the height of it. It really captures the grandeur of the Great Hall that we see in the movies. There's a simple bench and a table. On the bench actually is that wizard card that I hinted at earlier, this time a sticker on a 2x2 two two black tile. On the far right side you get Dumbledore's basically throne looking thing. And you can actually flip his chair up to look underneath and he's got a key hidden away in there. Not sure what that unlocks. Perhaps it's this chest, which is uh, disguising itself as a fireplace. And there is a red crystal on the inside there, which is quite fun. So many crystals hidden throughout this version of Hogwarts. I, I really like that. There's a game there, you know, a little contest between uh, the minifigures who can find the most crystals, something like that. Uh, and you could actually open up the top portion of the fireplace. And you'll find our second bonus minifigure hidden away in there. It's another piece the same one that appeared in Snape's class. Above that, there's just a few additional details like a white rat, another crystal ball, another brown owl, and then we've got this printed banner here too. And what's really fun about this is that it can be flipped over depending on who has won the house cup. So we got Slytherin and Gryffindor, of course, because the other two houses, especially in the first two movies, don't exist. Going back to the front, the roofs out here are made out of the same material that Hagrid's hut was. It's just a cardstock with the shingle texturing on it. You've got two bats here, some flames. Oh, I guess I didn't even make note of it, but you've got these transparent flames too for the floating candles, which is a pretty brilliant. Uh, especially for the pieces available at the time. Again, efficient use of parts, big pieces to build up a lot of volume. But to me, yeah, this set uh, is a total win. The amount of castle you got for 674 pieces 
is mind-boggling. I'm not alone in thinking this set is great as it actually won Toy of the Year in 2001 as well. Again, this is one of the sets that would be remade for the 20th anniversary and it's so much smaller with so many more pieces. And what's great too about this portion of the castle expansion in particular is that it will be able to combine directly with the Chamber of Secrets, which we will take a look at in the next revisiting Harry Potter. Now this is a beautiful looking box. Uh, we have the gradient in the sky here. This was common of Lego box art at the time. Harry is flying through the sky on his broomstick and of course we have young Harry from 2001 down in the corner here smiling at us. And then a feature that really stands out to me on the front of this box is that there's a little cardboard cutout in the front panel here. Uh, and this reveals some of the hidden secrets inside the castle. There are a bunch of spell books and some of the hidden spells and potions that are within, as well as the purple magnifying glass. Uh, and this is really fun for me because I actually used to hide these little spells inside the castle and then make my sister traverse through it to find all the little hidden spells. So it's fun that that's actually a feature on the front of this box showing what's within. Uh, so with that, we can actually open this front panel here to reveal two more panels of box art on the inside before you even get to the bricks. On the top panel, we can see there's more beautiful box art, again with this lovely sky and our three heroes going across the water in that scene when they first see the castle. Uh, and then we also have a scene of the backside of the castle here. Peeves is wreaking havoc in the Great Hall. Keys are flying out as well as a candle. Snape looking through a magnifying glass. We have more of our heroes hanging out here. And of course we have this great chain mechanism. That was such a fun part of the set, one of my favorite parts. And then on the back side, we also have some more rare things for Lego at the time. We have some alternate builds, which we'll talk about in the instructions too, but they're even featured here on the box itself. And it's rare that you'd see these alternate builds actually featured on the box of the set because that's not telling you what you can build initially with the instructions of the set. It's telling you the possibilities and that's highlighted on the box itself. Not something that LEGO would do today, let alone do al alternate builds in general. So it's really interesting that they did that on this box. And so now let's go inside the box and see some of the strange things that 2001 Harry Potter had that you don't really see in many other places. So I wanna start out by talking about these strange graphics that showed up inside uh, as you were going through the bags of the set. So they, these are actually just printed on paper. As you open the bags, you can actually pull these out, which you don't see in Lego sets now. So this is, of course, the boathouse arch and all of your minifigures right here. And then we move on to the lower part of the main tower, and that has both a one bag and a number two bag. And then when we go to the top part of the tower, it's no longer a piece of paper. It's actually printed onto the bag itself. So they're kind of inconsistent in the way that they're showing these images of what you can build. And I wanna note that these are real images of the set. These are not digital renderings. These are, someone actually took a photograph and then printed them onto these. Um, and then finally we have the Great Hall. So let's take a look at the instructions for 4709 Hogwarts Castle. So you open it up here and you actually have to turn the instruction booklet the other way, which is kind of interesting. And up top you see the same image that's represented in those little bags that you have, those little sheets of paper with the random black and white printed images. Uh, but that actually lets you know what you're gonna build for this big of a set. Uh, I believe it's because at the time Lego didn't actually number their bags. So what they needed to do was show you what you were building first, what was going to be inside that little bag that you're about to open. And once we finish the set, we get to take a look at our handiwork. Here is again that beautiful image that we saw in the box of the back of the castle. And here's another image that was on the box of Peeves wreaking havoc inside the Great Hall. Uh, so now let's move on and I think we're gonna see some alternate builds. Here's a bit more of the fun you can do inside the castle, uh, all of the play features. And then, funny enough, they actually show some of the features of the alternate builds before you even get to them. So now we're gonna turn the page and these are different from other alternate builds because they actually give you instructions. So they have step-by-step 
images of how you can reach the end result. Not many images, you're gonna have to place a lot of bricks for each one of these. So this seems to make a larger version of the boathouse where the boats come up, Hagrid is pulling them in with a chain here, which is really cool and it's a part of the movie that you don't see when their boats actually dock uh, and all the students have to get off. So this is kind of a fun way to expand on the story and get into a part that you actually didn't get to see in the film. So I think this is a really cool alternate bill. Dumbledore's hanging out, greeting the students as they come into dock here. There's a little knight up in the corner as well. Uh, so now let's move on to the next alternate build. And this one is interesting because it's actually three different sections right here. This one to me feels just kind of like a reimagining of the castle buildings itself. And then the last one and possibly the best alternate build for this set is the Gryffindor common room. This seems like a really worthwhile alternate build if you were to take a stab at one of them. You have the fat lady at the bottom, you have the fireplace that the Gryffindor common room is known for, you move on to the next story and you actually build a little four poster bed that's so iconic to the common room and then you can build the top section for Gryffindor Tower right here and hang a chain off of this little lantern here, which is pretty fun. And of course, it includes a spiral staircase, which is such an iconic piece from these sets. Uh, so this is a really fun alternate build. To me, probably the best one of this set. I also really love the docks, um, but these are more involved than the other alternate builds where they actually show you instructions because they're so large and has so many pieces. And yeah, there you go. That's a lot of sets. Before we wrap things up here, I want to take a moment to answer one of the most frequently asked questions in these revisiting videos. Which set do you think is the best? For the most part, it's unrealistic, unless you're a crazy collector like me, that you're going to get each and every one of these sets. In fact, I wouldn't recommend that. I, I don't think there's much of a point to that. So if you could only get one set, what would it be? For me, I think it would be Snape's class. It's got a great selection of figures, amazing parts, and it's just a lot of fun. It's a real standout when it comes to the Hogwarts expansions. But don't take my word for it. I've invited in a few familiar faces to give their thoughts on what the best LEGO Harry Potter Sorcerer's Stone set is. For me, my favorite is the Forbidden Corridor. I mean, you get all three of the Golden Trio, which is fantastic, especially Molded Fluffy, and even for a relatively small piece count, you get a considerable amount for the castle. It doesn't have a ton of play features, but I really didn't matter because the ones that they included, I thought were really well done. My favorite set from this 2001 Harry Potter wave has to be Hogwarts Castle, 4709. This is probably the most playable Harry Potter set that I can think of. I used to spend hours and hours playing with this, even with my sister. That makes it a pretty easy pick for my favorite set from this wave. Right here we have a look at the Lego Harry Potter Hagrid's Hut. I think it's a pretty unique set with some really cool detailing. The roofage is also really unique, so if you want to like shock people and show them something pretty, pretty different in the Lego space, this set is definitely for you. I never owned any Harry Potter sets prior to 2018's revival, but from this batch of sets, the standout to me is 4712, Troll on the Loose. Mostly because I just really want a modern day remake of this set, but also because I feel like that troll figure is just so strange looking and is also sort of one of the first uses of a big figure S character build. After digging through the archives, I actually found one that is probably one of the most obscure ones out there. This is set number 4721. It is Hogwarts Classrooms. And honestly, I feel like these classroom sets aren't really focused on too much in favor of some of the larger Hogwarts sets, but I actually really like what LEGO is trying to do with the aesthetic of them. Despite the set being pretty small and very basic, I don't know, I just really like the vibe of it, so I probably would have to go with Hogwarts Classrooms. Although, of course, I love all of them. Even though there are hundreds of LEGO Harry Potter sets in the LEGO portfolio at this stage, these first two waves, in my opinion, give us some of the best that we've ever seen. There's so many unique concepts that were executed surprisingly well for their time. And then there's the use of all these wonderful printed elements and magical play features that really made these sets a tremendous amount of joy to play with as a kid. There's the emphasis on modularity, which made each expansion to your castle all the more fun. There's these amazing molded characters like Fluffy, the troll, the goblins, crazy pieces LEGO fans up until this point had never even dreamed about getting. 
and things that we really haven't seen topped since. Yeah, some of the exterior aesthetics of these sets don't hold up so well. This is a bad example because this one looks pretty great. But I do really enjoy the emphasis on the interior setting, which arguably are much more well executed than the interiors that we see in the Hogwarts expansions today. For their time too, the minifigures are pretty groundbreaking with a lot of new molds, new pieces, and almost all of them had capes which is something I'd really love to see return to the Harry Potter theme. Even if it isn't screen accurate or any of that nonsense, a caped minifigure always looks better than a minifigure without a cape. Needless to say, I'm really excited to revisit more early LEGO Harry Potter themes. We have the Chamber of Secrets 2002-2003 sets, the Prisoner of Azkaban 2004 sets, the Goblet of Fire 2005 sets, and that one single Order of the Phoenix set too. I'm hoping to cover all of these in future revisiting episodes. But thank you everyone for watching. Have yourself a fantastic life, and I will see you next time.